we are live and we are going to wait a couple of minutes to give everyone an opportunity to share. And we will start this conversation, this amazing conversation with an amazing group of people in a couple of minutes. So we ask you to share, share the live, please. One more minute, one more minute before we go live in this conversation. Kingdom.
Okay, we are starting. And first, I really want to take a moment to thank everyone who has agreed to participate in this in this conversation. Um, it is at a very important time in our in Haiti's life and it is extremely important that we bring some important conversation and some explanation to a lot of Haitian, Haitian Americans and particularly to um, the international community. So uh, I thank all of the panelists who are here. Moi dis nous tout bonsoir. Moi remercie nous pour participation nous, pour disponibilité nous. Na conversation ça qui c'est une conversation qui est extrêmement important. Donc et qui t'aime commencer. I'll start by saying a few words. Um, our our country Haiti faces grave political and economic security crisis. Every week, the news is about kidnappings and killings. The victims are many. They are students. They are teachers doctors, lawyers, engineers, pastors, Freemasons, priests, nuns. They are old and they are young. Our hearts bleed when we read about a five-year-old girl who was kidnapped and she was killed because her mother, a street merchant, could not afford the 4,000 or 20,000 gourds that was asked of her to pay for ransom. In isolation, this is an outrage and it is a tragedy. But in Haiti today, it is part of a pattern of brutal abuses of human rights, kidnappings, rapes, murders, massacres, and something that instill fears in the entire population. With those few words, um, I really want to take a moment um, and pass the baton to uh, Congressman Jeffries um, to say a couple of words of welcome. And we played a video of uh, Congressman Jeffries. Sam. Time is a bit slow. I think we'll come back to uh, to Congressman Jeffrey's welcoming words. Um, Samuel, there you go. You're in, we're in mute, Sam. Greetings, I'm Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Chair of the House Democratic Caucus, and I'm proud to represent the 8th Congressional District in New York, home to one of the largest communities of Haitian Americans in the country. I want to thank the Fan Haiti's Democracy for convening this incredibly important conversation and for standing with the Haitian people who simply want a better life for themselves, their families, and for the future. In order to bring that about, we have to seriously reevaluate how we are going to engage with Haiti in the future. We can't continue to do the same things and expect different results because we all want to make sure that Haiti can thrive economically and with a free and fair society. We must end corruption. We must end poverty. We must end violence and the suffering and the pain and the death that we see all too frequently in the Republic of Haiti. And so I stand together with you as we stand together with the Haitian people to find a better way. And I'm confident that together, 
through sustained interest and intensity, we can ensure for the Haitian people that the best is yet to come. God bless you. God bless the people of Haiti and God bless the United States of America. Well, um, really wanna say a great thank you to uh, our Congressman from New York, um, Congressman Jeffries, who has taken a leadership role um, in partnership with another New York Congressman, Congressman Meeks, um, to really take um, Haiti to heart and to really um, put in policies that are going to help push forward a better relationship between the United States and Haiti. Um, what we know is as it stands today, there is consensus on a few things. We know that the Moise regime explicitly and some, sometimes implicitly involved in the chaos. Various reports from local and international human rights organization, even in Haiti from the DCPJ to BNU, and even from those in the international community who support the regime, who show their connections with what's happening in terms of the chaos. In this context, the de facto president understands the leeway he's been given and is craftily trying to force through a change to the constitution and organize elections while his government control all levels of the public sector. And that includes, of course, the illegitimate provisional electoral council. And we ask ourselves, will this help or cause further chaos? And are elections truly feasible in the circumstances where there are endemic government corruption, administrative incompetence, and state-sanctioned state violence to suppress dissidents. In this forum today, we have brought together a range of Haitian, Haitian and international experts, academics, to help answer many of the questions that we've gathered over time and to provide the evidence that we all need to reach informed opinions about the Haitian crisis and of course, about the solutions. We will first hear from Joey Bui, who will present Harvard's Law School's report on human rights abuse. She's from the IHRC, um, which is uh, the, the clinics in the school. And she will talk to us about what they have been able to document and what they have been able to um, put in the report, which has been very well read in, in Haiti but we think that many folks, particularly in the diaspora, may not have had the opportunity um, to do so. Before we go to Joey, we're going to play a very quick video by um, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who also wanted to send her greetings. Sam. Merci un peu. Why don't we, Sam, why don't we show Congresswoman uh, Maxine Waters a little bit later and let's move straight to the conversation that we want to have. Um, so, you know, as I said, we have some exceptional people here on this panel. Um, we will first hear from Joey, but we will also hear from former deputy, Deputy Jerry Tardieu, Madame Monique Kliska, who is an international expert, a writer. We'll talk more about who she is. Um, and she'll talk about, you know, the questions that affect women and girls. We will have uh, Madame Charlier, um, who will talk about the questions of corruptions we have Etienne Emil, uh, that many of you know, who will talk about issues on the economy. And we will have two, the, two other experts, um, Bill O'Neill and Jose Cardenas, who will give us one, the perspective of an international expert that works on governance 
and the other one, someone who is um, steep in sort of Washington's experiences um, to tell us, you know, how should the US approach this? So Joey, um, please tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what you found. We know that you and the Harvard team and the Harvard Law School, um, particularly the team at the International Human Rights Clinic, uh, work with uh, uh, different organizations in Haiti uh, to develop this report. Tell us who was involved in developing this report and give us a highlight what, what is in this report that people should hear or should know about. First, thanks, Johnny, and thanks so much for um, having me here today. Uh, as Johnny said, I'm here on behalf of Harvard's International Human Rights Clinic, and uh, I'll be presenting the report that we recently released in partnership with the Observatoire, which is a consortium of human rights organizations in Haiti. The report is called Killing with Immuni Impunity, State Sanctions Massacres in Haiti. It analyzes three attacks that we found particularly heinous and well-documented. They took place in Port-au-Prince over the last few years. There are the attacks in La Saline in 2018, in Bel Air in 2019, and in Cité Soleil in the summer of 2020. We relied on evidence documented by members of the Observatoire, our partners, especially Arendere Yash, as well as international investigations by the UN and some investigations by the Haitian judicial police themselves. We looked at the evidence under international criminal law and our principal finding is that these massacres likely amount to crimes against humanity. I would uh, like to go through the three key findings that we made. First, the attacks follow a pattern that amounts to crimes against humanity. The scale, pattern and intensity of violence in these attacks indicate that they're not isolated or random but that they're widespread and systematic attacks to target the residents of these neighborhoods. Each of the attacks were brought against neighborhoods known for their opposition to the government and took place during times of intense protests against Moise's administration. In each attack, the gangs arrived in the neighborhood and brutally murdered, raped, and tortured residents. The evidence also suggests that the attacks were pre-planned and followed a gang policy and an implicit state policy to repress the political opposition. The massacres also repeatedly involved gangs affiliated with the G9 Alliance, which reportedly has government connections and is led by Jimmy Sheritzia, alias Barbecue. I'll take the La Salina attack as an example to show that the attack was planned and not isolated or a random incident. The La Saline attack followed some of the largest protests that had taken place in Haiti in recent history. La Saline is known to be a, an important starting point for protesters and is a historical stronghold to an opposition party of Moise's political party. A month before the attack, protesters actually prevented President Moise from entering the area for a ceremony. Two weeks before the protest, Two senior officials from Moise's government met with gangs, including Sheritzia, and planned the attack on La Saline. On November 13, 2018, gangs arrived in police vehicles and, along with certain police officers, attacked residents for 14 hours, shooting indiscriminately, burning houses, raping, and torturing. At least 71 people were killed in the La Saline attacks. Our second key finding is that these attacks were carried out with significant government involvement. This means government officials and certain police officers who directly participated in the attacks. It also includes the Haitian police for repeatedly failing to help civilians during the attacks, even though these attacks took place very close to numerous police stations and residents repeatedly called for help. Our key finding our third key finding is that these government actors can be liable under international criminal law for crimes against humanity. Liability for these crimes don't just cover people who directly carried out the crime, but also covers those who participated in planning, instigating, or assisting in the crimes. 
This means the government officials, police offices. We found that President Moise himself may also be liable for his failure to prevent government officials from committing the crimes and for failing to punish them after they did so. I'd, I'd like to leave it to the other panelists here to talk about the broad implications of these gross human rights violations and the fact that Moise's government has a role in them. I will say that legally, the finding of crimes against humanity opens new doors for accountability. The Haitian government has a duty under international law to investigate and prosecute perpetrators of these crimes. And since there are no statutes of limitations on crimes against humanity, that means uh, the perpetrators can stand for trial as long as they live. As for the international community, crimes against humanity are an affront to all of humanity. So under the principle of universal jurisdiction, other states could prosecute the perpetrators if they're found there. These crimes can also be tried at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And the UN can refer these crimes to the International Criminal Court, which our report recommends. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm really honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joey. Um, this uh, very powerful presentation really uh, is, is a way for us to, to better understand the gravity of the crimes that are being committed in Haiti and the complicity of senior government official and members of the security services. I think part of why we wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity for you to present this is because quite often people would say, well, you know, these people are not government officials. Um, but government has an obligation to protect, but moreover, um, there has been proven report, and again, not just by human rights organization, which many folks seem to dismiss, but even from official sources, for example, DCPJ, which is responsible for, uh, it's the police arm that does investigation. And so for those who may, may think that this is some kind of story that is being concocted, either by the international community and or by human rights organization, they should dispel themselves of this idea because what we find is that there is sufficient proof here um, that is brought by the official um, institution to show the linkages that exist. Um, so in this context, we ask ourselves whether a reform to the constitution will really resolve the crisis that Haiti is facing right now. Um, Constitutional reform sounds nice, and it has become a primary focus of the uh, Moise administration. In fact, many diaspora colleagues and friends have bought into the regime's argument. They usually argue that since we all know that there is a need to change some articles um, in the 1987 constitution, why not let the president um, create a new one, especially since there's no parliament and that if parliament was there, they would never allow the president to make those changes. Many folks forget that the president's party and, it, and its allies actually had the majority in the previous parliament. And so had they wanted to do this, they could have done it. I am going to introduce someone that needs no real introdu introduction, particularly on the question of the constitution and that is Deputy, Deputy Jerry Tardieu. Um, I am truly delighted to introduce Deputy Char Tardieu, who chaired a congressional committee on constitutional reform. Uh, Deputy Tardieu is someone who spent over a year going in the diaspora and across Haiti to help gather people's input about what kind of changes were necessary uh, to make in the constitution. Before I pass you the mic, uh, 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 Deputy, Deputy Tardieu, I'm getting my French and Creole and, and English together. Um, let's just uh, run the welcome that we had uh, uh, from uh, Congresswoman Maxine Water. Sam.
Sam, you still have issues with the with the video. Ah, there you go. You want me? Uh, let me begin by thanking Johnny Celestine, spokesperson for Defend Haiti's Democracy, for that introduction and for all of his efforts to organize this timely and important event. And I congratulate everyone who helped assemble this panel including Defend Haiti's Democracy and the Human Rights Clinics at the Harvard, Yale, and New York University's law schools. Haiti is indeed at a crossroads. Two years ago, in April 2019, I traveled to Haiti and met with the victims of the Lesseline Massacre, who recounted the horrific events of November 2018, which they believe were intended to punish them for their support for the Lavalas Party. I warned them then that unless there was accountability for the killings at Les Salines, Haiti would descend into a spiral of chaos and violence. And that is exactly what has happened. There's been no accountability for the killings at Les Salines or the killings at Bel Air or City Tokyo or City Soleil or anywhere else. And Haiti is descending into an ever tidal spiral of chaos and violence. President Jovenel Moise now says he wants elections, but only after a referendum on the Constitution, which is really an audacious and unconstitutional power grab. The changes he proposed to the Constitution would completely eliminate the Senate, replace the semi-independent prime minister with a vice president, and allow Moise to handpick an electoral council that would run the next two presidential elections. It is critical that the United States government not provide any type of support for this unconstitutional referendum. All signs point to the Moise administration systemically dismantling Haiti's democracy. Police meet peaceful protesters with tear gas, clubs, and bullets. Dissidents and journalists have been arrested and killed. Free, fair, and credible elections is simply not possible under these repressive conditions. So I thank all of you for your commitment to human rights and democracy in Haiti. It is my hope that together we can advocate for policies here in the United States using all the diplomatic tools available to us that will support the protection of human rights in Haiti and give the people of Haiti the ability to control their own destiny as a free and democratic people. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who's been really a stalwart supporter of, of Haiti and of Haitians. Um, so, um, Deputy Taudju, there is no one better, again, as I said earlier, to explain this. And so I'll start with you with a question. Um, can you tell us why sh this president shouldn't be trusted to create a new constitution? Because that's what a lot of our friends that you and I maybe know in common um, have been asking. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me as a participant uh, in such an important forum. Uh, my hats off to all the participants. I know most of them. Uh, congratulations, obviously, to uh, your organization and all others who have joined hands in order to, to materialize this, this, this event today. Well, um, the president's bold move um, to impose a new constitution is bound to fail for two fundamental reasons. First of all, it is illegal, unconstitutional, unpopular, and it will bring us very close to chaos while what we need is serenity, peace, and democracy. The process is not inclusive. It's not participative. Jovenel Moïse has chosen a five-member commission of friends and asked them to work on a new constitution. As of now, we do not know who worked on this new constitution proposal, nor the experts, nor the lawyers, nor the experts. We know nothing except that there is a new text circulating, a new text that is being proposed as the new constitution of Haiti. And 
this text in its content is also a text that has inspired a, 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 an expression to qualify this new constitution, la constitution de l'impunité, the constitution of impunity. Because if the process is not participative and inclusive as it should be when it comes to adopting a new constitution, the content of what they are proposing is even scarier in the sense that it's going to concentrate all the powers in the hands of a monarch president to the detriment of the legislative and the judiciary. So what we have right now is a real dictatorship in the making as this constitution, if allowed to pass, would set, I would say, would pave the way for future presidents to govern without any accountability. The commission that I've chaired in parliament had three objectives. We wanted to re-equilibrate the power. We wanted to responsible to give the president its full responsibility. And thirdly, we wanted to structure and strengthen the institution in the state. Well, this new constitution in the way that they have drafted it is doing exactly the contrary. And I will say one thing, since this uh, conversation today is geared towards our friends in the diaspora, I'm telling them, uh, uh, be aware of the diaspora, because Jovenel Moïse might not be the friend he claims to be because you are being sold a new constitution where you would have the right to vote in the next elections. I am telling you that there is nothing in this constitution that will allow you to vote in the next elections. Now, they are telling us, giving us the one around that, hey, we're going to put this right in the new electoral law. But you know, you and I know, Johnny, that if it's not embedded in the constitution, it is never going to stay. It is going to be subject to the whims of future decision makers, and it will take only a couple of months before that right that you deserve as Asian Americans are taken away from you. So in conclusion, I would say to your question, to that first question, this process of imposing a new constitution is illegal and constitutional and popular. The process is illegal. The content is dangerous. We need to fight it if we love Haiti and we love and want democracy for this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Deputy uh, Cardieu. Um, your insight is, is extremely important because you work so hard on this and it is invaluable for us to learn from people like you and from the expertise that you bring. Um, I think for many uh, of our colleagues in the diaspora who have dreamed about this ability to be full citizens and full participants in Haitian democracy, um, there, there is sort of this last hope that this could be um, the way that they get this right. And, and I want to um, say to all of my friends that um, to trample on our constitution in order for us to have a right um, is not something that is long lasting. And I hope that they would truly look at what's in these um, uh, constitutional reform, which by the way, has the same articles um, that the older ones had in terms of you have to, you can't have double nationality. You, you have to have paid your taxes in Haiti for five years. You have to have lived in Haiti for five years. You have to have a home or um, be practicing uh, a, a job in Haiti. And so the idea on top of what uh, Deputy Tardieu just mentioned, the idea that you think you can leave New York, Miami, France, Santo Domingo, wherever you are to go to Haiti and run for office um, is a policy. Um, and I think the job that the government is doing right now um, to sell you a bill of good is just that. It is a bill of goods and you need to do your due diligence because it's important to understand what it is that uh, they are telling us. And actually, if I may add, Johnny, having faced a wall of hostility in Haiti, um, Jovenel Moïse has turned to the diaspora to get 
the legitimacy abroad that he cannot get home. So his selling um, an idea, is selling some rights, is selling a project that does not exist. And my point is the following. I'm saying you in the diaspora, the Haitian American community at this crossroad needs to be very vigilant because it might be the only time where this issue can be seriously taken into consideration. And you might never ever have the right to vote again if at this cornerstone of Haiti's life, you're not being able to impose this right that you deserve. Now, if Jovenel Moïse persists in trying to impose a constitution in the way that he's doing it, is going to jeopardize the only chance you have to really have this right put in the constitution whenever we can work on a new constitution. And when will that be? It will be a time where Haiti's civil society, Haitian political parties, all included, will be able to sit around a table and discuss the fate of the nation. Constitution is not a matter of one political party, one leader, or a group of people. Drafting a new constitution is about the most patriotic engagement of anyone in public service. It cannot be taken lightly. So I think it is very important for our friends in the diaspora to understand that they're being misled and they are being asked and offered the possibility of voting for a referendum because we need also to pinpoint that there is an electoral council as illegitimate as the process of drafting a new constitution that has not been sworn in in front of the highest court of the country that has been put in charge of organizing a referendum that itself is illegal and prohibited by the constitution. So we are talking about a process that is rotten from the beginning, from the get go throughout the whole process. And even if there were some good provisions in this so-called new constitution, the fact that it's contaminated from the process that's not participative and inclusive it does contaminate the whole rest of the exercise. So it puts the country in jeopardy and it puts, the, it puts our ability to really think about a new constitution in grave danger. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy, for, for this um, clarification. Um, so uh, you know, one of the most terrifying violations of our constitution in recent years has been the violent attacks on communities and abuses of human rights, as we heard earlier from Joey and as uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters alluded to in her opening. Recently, we have seen a particularly uh, pernicious form of abuse, and that is the blanket targeting of girls and of young women for sexual assaults and kidnapping as a method to really suppress dissent. And as the Me Too movement has demonstrated globally, it is incredibly difficult for the survivors of such crimes to speak out. And as a result, they are often in silence, they stay in silence, and they are in hiding. Um, the US government has been speaking out about gender-based violence across the world, but appears to not take those abuses, those widespread state-sanctioned abuses against women and girls in Haiti. And here really to explain a little bit more about the current crisis and its impact on women and girls is Madame Monique Kliska. Um, Madame Kliska is currently international consultant. Um, she's had a career of more than 25 years specializing in high level policy dialogues, human rights, youth and women programming. She, is, she has worked in crisis communication um, she's a published author, and she has done a lot and a lot and a lot. 
too much for me to highlight here. But what we really want to make sure that we talk about with uh, uh, Madame Tisca, um, and she's also a very engaged, I, I should add, a very engaged uh, member of, of civil society. Madame Tisca, give us a sense of, from your perspective, how this crisis is affecting women and girls. And give us sort of a brief you know, context of, of what that means for Haitian women and Haitian girls right now. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to have been invited and to be part of uh, the, the various people who I see uh, on the panel uh, who are all very distinguished in their own right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, before that, I, I want to set the stage uh, because very, I think even your, uh, the presentation started with Haiti is in the midst of a political crisis. And I wanted to kind of say that Haiti is not in a political crisis. Haiti is an existential crisis. It is a crisis that involves politics. It is a constitutional crisis as a Deputy Tardieu just mentioned. It is an economic crisis, as I'm sure it's Emile will describe. It is a governance crisis, as I'm sure uh, Velina Elise Tardieu will talk about. And it is a social justice crisis, mm. as well as a humanitarian crisis. Mm. And the aspect of uh, mm. gender-based violence uh, involves uh, that. And uh, millions are affected. I mean, they are about one third of Haiti's population, over 4.2 million people who are in dire needs of uh, help because they can't eat well, they have lost jobs. So it is a major existential crisis that we're going through. Now, uh, I also want to, uh, one of the things that I want to say and linked with what the Joey Bowie talked about, the, the broad context of human right abuse, it's all about installing terror, and it is also suppressing dissent, and the women are part of it. Everybody comes through, but the women in particular. And just a few examples, somebody like Marie, who was in her 50s, and who lived through the, the massacre in Bel Air, and she managed to get away, but she lost everything. Her house was burnt down. So you have a woman who has, who doesn't have a lot of means, but who managed to do this, and she went and lived in the Shanmas Park for several weeks until she could get some help. You have people like a uh, Guillain Police who's 27 years old, pregnant, seven months pregnant, was shot in the head in her house because gangs were fighting in the neighborhood. You have Meridina Fleurimont, eight months old, who got shot in the arms while her mother was carrying her, was shot in the arms. You have also in La Saline, in the La Saline a massacre that Joey Bui talked about, there were about nine to 10 gang rapes, rapes in front of the husbands, rapes in front of the children. There has always been, rape is like throughout history. So rape is not something new. Unfortunately, rape is what happens usually women and girls are usually at the forefront of that kind of violence when there is conflict, because they are there, because uh, they are seen as easy prey. And I want to make sure that I say this, rape is not about sex. Rape has nothing to do with sex. Rape is about power. And anyone who can study rape in prisons they know that men rape, men rape men. And that has this, things like this happen also in Haiti, but the girls and the women are at the forefront of that. So I wanted to make sure to talk uh, about that. 
So you have the kidnappings. Kidnappings, one, one thing that really hit me, there was one kidnapping of a, she was a sausage vendor, but she was tortured with fire on her arms. The men there, they were both kidnapped. He was not tortured, but why was she tortured? Because they saw her as an easy prey. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is that really civil and political rights abuse, saying that is really an understatement in Haiti that we live in right now. And I think with what has been said, it is very really clear. So the right to assemble, the right to expression, the right to minimum health care, the right to education, to decent jobs, consequences of a lot of what is going on is trauma, trauma. You have orphan children, you have widows, you have widowers, you have homelessness, job loss, plus you have women and girls who are traumatized maybe for their lives, for their lives. And that is, that is a trauma that will be carried in the new Haiti that we need to analyze what is going on in that. Now, you have a random kind of violence, just an example. Two weeks ago, the police threw tear gas inside a church, inside a church, right after the end of a service. All of Haiti's bishops were in attendance. So it shows you don't respect girls, you don't respect women, you don't respect men, you don't respect bishops, you don't respect anything. So I want to put, for example, a parallel because the whole human right aspect, I think also, I want to do a parallel because we're talking to the diaspora with George Floyd's murder. George Floyd's murder prompted a call that was not only in the United States, but worldwide for the end of racism, for social justice, for police reform. The parallel I want to draw in Haiti so that we don't say that it's a political crisis, that we understand the magnitude of the crisis is that the July riot of Haiti, the July 2018 riots of Haiti and the Petro Caribe corruption scandal have prompted the call for a different governance system that is not based on corruption and impunity. And it has also promote, prompted the call for a social justice agenda so that women can participate freely, so that everyone can participate freely. And one of the things that I have heard repeatedly in the streets while participating in different uh, demonstrations is that it wasn't a question of money not being there. Four billion dollars were there. So it was enough to put schools. It was enough to put hospitals, healthcare. It was enough to make transformational change in Haiti so people could start living with dignity. It was enough to put centers to treat gender-based violence practically in every department, plus universities. They stole the money. They used the money for themselves. And that was, I think, the shock. That was the knee of the police on the Haitian people saying you stole $4 billion when you could have given us health centers, you could have given us centers that could treat women and girls, you could have put universities, schools, et cetera. So in closing, I want to be very clear. Mm. Haitians have no issue with elections. Of course, Haitians want elections, mm. but we don't want elections with the people mm. who are there who have caused us mm. so much pain, so much killing and have forced us to retreat into our homes. We're like animals retreating into our homes. We can't go out, we can't socialize. We are being dehumanized by the terror 
that is being sprung on us by the uh, Moise government. So the agenda that we want is a social justice agenda with health, with a care for girls and women, with education, with decent jobs. So I wanted to put that in a larger context so that the abuse that is going on of everyone, but particularly of girls and women, you have pregnant women being shot in the head in her home. So that's what we're talking about, or women dying of maternal mortality because there are no supplies in the hospital. She's on the floor, she's dying. So uh, uh, in closing, I will say that yes, Haiti is at a crossroads. You can choose, you know, to go the dictatorship, the corrupt governance system, or you can choose to go with a new Haiti with Haitian voices, with Haitians determining our future, controlling our future, and controlling our sovereignty, regaining and controlling our sovereignty. So it's not corrupt people like Jovenel Moise and the others who are deciding for us, but so that what we want is what is on the front burner and what is being decided. So we want their knees removed from our necks so that we can breathe again, so that we can have the future that Haiti deserves with dignity. We want dignity, we want healthcare. We want everything that everybody has. We're not asking for richness. We're, I mean, middle class, we just want to be able to live with a certain amount of dignity. And last but not least, as you can see, women are at the forefront of the voices being heard, and we will continue to be at the forefront in power structures when there is a new governance system in Haiti. We will not let it go. We are 52% of the population, and we aim to hold at least 50% of the power when things are new. So thank you very much. I've spoken maybe a little too much, but I'm passionate about it all. So I'm ready for questions and for comments when we all finish. Thank you. Madame Kutka, you, you made, you made, you made some bouger tellement que au parler avec passion, you spoke with such strength and power. And I think, for, for, for those of us who are here in the United States who may not um, fully grasp what's happening in Haiti, I think it is important to recognize the, um, the women, as you said, who are stepping forward and saying that they want to live with dignity, putting their lives, putting their body on the line. Um, and, and I am so, so uh, at all of, of all of you who are taking this 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 role um, to better our society. And I think that comes naturally with a lot of sort of, you know, women being in the forefront of, of the fight for freedom. So I wanna thank you. I know that it is a very difficult topic to discuss and it is horrific when we talk about abuse of women and girls. Um, it is also very difficult to hear about the shocking cases but I think it is important for us to end the silence around violence against women. Um, we hear too many examples of young women being killed by their spouse, young women being abused by their spouse. Um, I think it's important for us men, not just Haitian men, I don't wanna say Haitian men, I think for us men to understand that this is simply not an acceptable situation. And so as, you know, as we, we move along, I think you know it is crucial for women leaders like you to help rebuild the country and for courageous young women who are stepping up and playing a very vital role in civil society's response to what's happening in Haiti. One such vital and powerful woman is Madame Charlier. Uh, uh, Madame Charlier Vellina is an activist. She is a feminist, a mother of three amazing girls I have one, a member of the Nopabdomi Collective. She fights against corruption 
impunity and wants to bring social change to, to her loving country, to Haiti. Through her involvement in politics, she wants to encourage Haitians, especially young people, to get involved in order to do politics differently. She studied business administration and she had a major in marketing. Valina, uh, please tell us why must we address the issue of corruption in Haiti? Um, hi, Johnny. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. And thank you to everybody listening to us. Um, thank you very much, Monique. You said it all. Thank you, Jerry. You also said it all. So I'm going to make my statement. I'm talking a lot about um, corruption, what, what um, Haiti's real problem is. Um, Haiti's biggest problem today is not corruption. In fact, it is impunity. And impunity is probably the only reason why there are so many government officials that are involved in corruptions because they simply know that no matter the extent of the financial crime that they do or any other crime, they will get away with it. And because of impunity, it destroys all attempts that we made to establish the rule of law, democracy, or to simply give people a decent life to improve quality of life. Because of corruption, impunity, and security, um, Haiti today has become an unlivable place. We are living in a gangster state, point blank. This is what Haiti is today. And in recent years, what we have seen happening is that many um, corrupts and individuals would use their ill-gotten wealth to finance crooked um, politicians or to finance themselves. And then they would run for elections, they would corrupt the elections, and then they will get elected and they would benefit from the immunity that comes with their elected positions. So in fact, today, I want to put an emphasis on it that our problem is impunity. What Haiti was, would need today is um, justice, as simple as that. And this is the only way for us to break with the cycle of continuous corruption, of continuous abuse from politicians on the country. In 2018, when petro challengers like myself, we started to ask for government accountability and justice in the petro Caribe scandal, what happened is that we quickly saw corrupted government officials going all over radio, trying to destroy our reputation or saying that we were being paid to do the protest, to do the sittings, as if the corruption that there is in Haiti is not enough to fuel your anger, as if you're stupid, you don't have a brain. So the only reason why you would protest against corruption is because you are being paid. It's so easy to say that people are being paid to protest for their rights in Haiti because they know that they have stolen so much that we have nothing, that people would go and do any kind of bad action for a dollar or two dollars because they need to eat. They know that they keep us by the belly. So that's why they went very quickly into radio and started to attack our reputation. However, what we saw is um, after many nonviolent protests, the court of auditor published three reports. And those reports were shocking. It was thousands of pages about corruption, about how over four billions of dollars were just vanished, dilapidated. They went into foolishness. They went into very bad projects. And, 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 they were, and it was so shocking to read in the reports that even the then um, president was involved in what the court of auditor referred to as an embezzlement scheme. And nothing happened. None of them have ever been prosecuted. Nothing happened. All of these reports are still sitting in the Senate in somebody's drawer. That's it, point blank. And to date, we have not seen any actions being taken by our justice system. We have not seen the petro Caribe scandal set the tone for better governments. As if that corruption case, as if that huge financial um, crime is not enough 
to set the tone and say, okay, we need better governance. We need um, to follow the rules. We need to stop stealing as if that was not enough. On the contrary, what we see happening is the court of auditor working more and more in difficulty. They're working on the threats. Some of them have left Haiti to go abroad because their lives were at risk. And what we're seeing is that the current government even issued a decree to diminish the control power of the court. So it was as if um, Haiti became officially a corruption state. And it's as if, if you are not involved in quality, uh, uh, I mean, in corruption in this country, you are some kind of morons. That's how they refer to you. There's a way of saying that if you don't get along with the corruption, then you are just plain stupid. This is what we're seeing in Haiti. And this is what's killing our country. And this is why justice is what we need. And what we are seeing in Haiti, like Monique said earlier, it's not only a problem of corruption or impunity. We are living a societal crisis, a societal crisis that is rooted in years of social inequalities, of exploitation of the masses. And today, we, the people, we are asking for accountability. We are asking for justice. We are asking for a country where we can live with dignity. We don't want to go and risk ourselves at sea for illegal immigration or to go and fight for our lives and, and, and or live the, the, the life that we have here, our families. We don't want that. We want to be able to live in our country like any other human being would be happy to live in their country. Me, myself, I want this country to be an option for my daughters. And day by day, Haiti is not becoming an option for my daughter. And it is very hard when you live in a country that is so corrupted and that has so much impunity, it fuels your anger because you know that this country is never going to be an option for my daughters. So why am I fighting? Why am I living here? And why is it that a small group, very, very small group of corrupted politicians can decide that they are going to change the constitution but just because they want to escape justice? just because they want to run away with whatever crime that they, has, they had committed. No, it has to stop. Public funds that were supposed to be used to develop the country and create jobs and redistribute wealth, they were diverted, squandered, and corruption has become systemic. This is what we're seeing in Haiti. And because of that corruption and impunity, there is simply no hope for young people. There is no hope for them they don't even try to reach their full potential. It is easier for them to go and get involved into the gangs because they have become an easy prey and the gangs use them as henchmen. And it's easier for them to go and make a living in what I call the economy of kidnapping, the economy of corruption, the economy of rape. This is what we're having in Haiti today. We are at zero in terms of a real economy, what we are seeing is an economy of kidnappings. Young people get involved into gangs and they know that they will get away with it with full impunity because the gangs are very pro-government. They're very close to the government officials. So they know that they will never be punished for it. So it's easy for them to go and start killing people. And I also want to point out that there is a US embargo on guns on Haiti. So who is who are smuggling the guns into our country? Who are they? How do they get away with it? How, if they weren't very close to very highly ranked government officials, they would continuously get away with it? So I want to say that again. We don't only have a problem of corruption or political crisis or Haitians cannot get along, or we want to take the power, but don't go to election. We have an impunity problem. And in order to achieve the necessary stability and move forward, Haiti needs first and foremost justice. Government accountability, that movement that we started as Petro Challenger, it brought to light the hope that we would end the era of corruption that we would prosecute those who took advantage of the misery of the people. 
to enrich themselves and to enrich their family. And um, I want to finish by saying that the societal crisis that we are seeing in Haiti can only come to an end when we reach that rupture point. And as citizens, the rupture we're asking for is a rupture from corruption, it's a rupture from impunity, and it's a rupture from this system, this current system that is anti-democracy. There is no democracy in Haiti. I'm 40 year, years old and I'm even asking myself if I have ever lived under any democratic government in Haiti. I've never seen what real democracy is in Haiti. I also want to add that we must set an example. It's too easy for government to come to power, steal our money, destroy our country, kill our people, and think that they can get away with it by simply changing the constitution. No, that has to stop. Any corrupted government must know that at the end of their reign, they will face justice and justice will be served. Thank you. Wow. Well, um, powerful words. Uh, I thank you. Thank you really for your words. And I, I just want to pause here because I think it's important for me to say that the reason why we do, we, we, we're doing this forum this way is because number one, we want to bring people who are living in Haiti, who are active in Haiti, who are fighting for justice in Haiti, who are fighting for social justice in Haiti, who are fighting for equality in Haiti. And I think very often I hear from Haitian Americans is that they don't understand what's happening. They hear, you know, this group says that and that group says this and they get confused and they don't understand, you know, what to believe. The first thing we're saying here is that everyone that has spoken has spoken about facts, has referred to a report, something that has been published that anyone can go and research. And I think part of the problem is that if we allow ourselves to kind of be led um, without going in and, and, and reading about the facts ourselves, sometimes we would think, well, both sides have a point. No, both sides don't have a point. There are facts and there are those who are lying. And I think it's important for anyone who's interested um, to learn about what's happening in Haiti and form an opinion about what's happening in Haiti, to not only listen to these voices here, but also to go and check the reports. They usually have a summary component that will give you the, the highlights of what's being talked about. Those reports that Valina talked about, Nupap Domi did not write those reports. Those reports was created by a court, an administrative court that is responsible for auditing the government, a court that this administration has unilaterally tried to reduce its power to control government spending. Ask yourselves why. If you live here in America, you know that things have to be audited. So why is it if someone has to be audited in Haiti, all of a sudden it's a question that you hate this government or you hate this person that's in power? No, it's about accountability. So with those words, um, I think, you know, with, with leaders like Velina and her colleagues at Nupap Demi, I think um, we have hope that there's potential real change in the horizon. And now I would like to turn to another young leader in Haiti, the renowned economist, um, Edzer Emil. Um, Edzer has been doing a fantastic job going around the country, really talking to the population about what's happening from an economics perspective. That is his background. He holds an MBA in finance and banking from Tan Kang University in Taiwan. And he has a bachelor's degree in economics from University of Kiskeya. He is the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, head of tourism department and professor at the University of Kiskeya in Port-au-Prince. He also trained at the Harvard Kennedy School and he's the co-founder of Fondation Avenir and director of IT Efficace. Itzel, could you explain to those who are listening and watching this the impact 
of what we are experiencing in this period, what we call the, in this, the constitutional crisis, the impact of the constitutional crisis on the economy and the intersection between political crisis and the economy. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, uh, Congressman Jirita Jay, really na, um, and then um, everyone here on this uh, conversation and people following on Facebook. Um, I mean, I was in Monique Kleska also, and Monique Kleska put a very critical word when she talked about the existential crisis, and I was about to say that it's not just a constitutional crisis. It was actually just one, one piece of the whole crisis that became permanent and normal. What I call normal, that doesn't mean that's a good situation, but it's a situation that we get used to it and become a part of our daily life as a people, right? The link with economy, to just to answer your question, Johnny, is you know whether constitutional crisis or political crisis is uh, uncertainty, right? The, the biggest enemy of economic activity, investment, or growth is uncertainty. So the political crisis, you know, institutional crisis, constitutional crisis, they create an uncertainty that actually killing the economy. So the constitutional crisis keep the government busy, the national community busy, the media busy. People talk about kidnapping. People talk about, you know, those all those uh, topic about uh, uh, the the constitutional issue, but at the same time we see the 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 the, the business climate getting worse, and then business uh, has been killed, and we see acceleration of poverty. Just a number. There were two million people in humanitarian situation in 2016, right after the Hurricane Matthew. The number has doubled last month to reach 4.4 million people, you know, uh, from the UN uh, data. That is a catastrophe. But this time is without any natural disaster. Because in 2016, we had a disaster, but now no natural disaster. And we have two, you know, 200, I mean, uh, 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 you have double of people actually who, have, who are in, in humanitarian situation. But the, 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 the main reason is political and bad governance disaster. And then I, was, I want to point out some number to really show the impact of this crisis on the economy. For example, in 2017, Haiti received $375 million of FDI, foreign direct investment. Last year, we had only $55 million. That's more than 500% of decrease. That's crazy. But let's talk about the economy growth. Last year, it was minus 4%. 2019, it was one, minus 1.2%. 1 and that's the first time we have a two consecutive negative growth in Haiti in 20 years. So, that means it's very critical. And those numbers are you know, from Haiti Central Bank and the Ministry of Finance. And we could give other numbers like the trade deficit were only 948 million from October, 2019 to February, 2020. And in the same period of time this year, it's $1.5 billion of trade deficit. So it's almost double, you know, compare uh, 2019 and now. And then the exchange rate grow from October 1st to now uh, for 27%. And the government revenue fell by 10% on a quarterly basis just for three months. And then the government actually uh, just collect only 68% of the forecast revenue, you know, in the budget. And then that make the budget deficit now around almost $40 billion, which actually higher than the acceptable sailing for 12 months budget deficit. 
So, and then I could go over other numbers. We could talk about tourism sector, for example, even we don't have official numbers uh, from the government, but we, we all know that the, 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 the decline is drastic in terms of uh, 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 arrivals. And we could talk about different sector, but let's go straight to the point. Nowadays, the word that is everywhere in this country we've been listened to is referendum. You know, but who's wondering about the lack of business funding? Who cares about the decrease of government revenue? Who cares about the decrease of national agriculture output? Who cares about the, the, the killing of tourism sector? The economy is not on our leader's agenda. Private credit is not on the agenda. Investment neither. And security, gangs activity, violence, massacre, and kidnapping or killing commerce sector, tourism, all the sector, service sector, and impoverished, impoverished middle classes, middle class with job loss and ransom payment for family and friends. And then we have to notice no one ever get freed by the police. So you have to pay your ransom. But at the same time, even you, when you go to the police to ask for help, this just gonna tell you, you have to pay. I experienced myself with friends and employees. Terror become a methodology to keep power and make money. I'm gonna say something very, very sensitive right now. Do you know guys, every single police operation in gang area costs the national budget almost 100 million goods. It's actually more than a million dollars. While no gang member, no gang leader ever arrested. The current police chief has already done seven of this type of operation. No result. This money could be used to fund business projects for youth or, or water infrastructure in Plateau Central or health facility in Laguna. Haiti has become the Somalia case for the region and the economy is collapsing. But at the same time, we don't see the, the will and the decision from the government to really end this. It seems like violence is a choice for a government. Instability is a type of governance. The breaking up is a must. We really need to turn this page. We really need to work together to bring new governance in this country that can pursue social and economic objective for all in terms of jobs and better condition for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. And I think um, it, it's important for, again, for folks to, to, to understand that our objective is if you want to solve a problem, I think it is important for you to um, understand what's happening. Um, I, I participate in some conversation and people say, well, you know, you don't, don't talk bad about Haiti um, or don't send the bad signal about Haiti because uh, uh, that's going to make Haiti look bad. Well, you know, it's important for us as, as, as Haitians and as a, as a community of people who want to see justice to make sure that um, we have a country that is, in fact, as it's just mentioned, working towards an economic system that works for the majority. Um, today, the UN is asking international donors for $235 million to feed a million and a half Haitians because they're going hungry, uh, right? And so, you know, we need to make choices. Um, we read not too long ago from Miami Herald's that this regime is spending almost like a million dollars, maybe you know a lot more, um, to uh, uh, to work uh, with uh, some lobbyists in the U.S. to change their image. When that money could be used um, to help you know create businesses or to feed their own population, surely the international community, instead of focusing purely on aid, can do more to help ordinary Haitian citizens to end this crisis. So with that in mind, I want to turn to Bill O'Neill. Bill is a lawyer specializing in humanitarian 
in human rights and refugee law. He has held senior roles at the UN in Kosovo and Rwanda and led the legal department of the UN OAS mission in Haiti. So he knows Haiti. He investigated mass killings in Afghanistan in the human rights situation in Darfur. He is a global expert in the rule of law and peace operation. Um, Bill will provide us his overview on the current crisis in Haiti as presented by our experts here today and its resonance with crises that he has seen across the world. Bill, is this the kind of what we would call a constitutional coup cool phenomenon that we have seen in um, many other uh, countries and, and you know, in, in Africa where you know, the presidents um, have changed uh, uh, the constitution. We can go from uh, President uh, uh, Nasengebe in Togo, Museveni in Uganda, Debbie in Chad, Bia in Cameroon, um, Kagame in Rwanda, who we love, Asian <laughs> love, El Sisi in Egypt. They've all changed their country's constitution to eliminate the two term limits, and even Haiti. Um, we've had our own very own President Duvalier who used the tool of referendum first to change the Haitian constitution to make himself president for life. And then again, held a second referendum to lower the age to become president so that his son can take over. Um, so from everything that you've heard here, Bill, what's your sort of, uh, uh, how can you wrap this together for us and help us see this from not just, you know, a Haiti, but put it in a, in a, in a larger lens for us. Uh, you're, you're on mute, Bill. All right. There you go. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for including me in this great conversation. Um, part of me, I, I know there's an old Creole proverb that, that all of you know, so for me, actually, I think it's good that people are so focused on, on the constitution and the law. That's actually a good thing, but it has to be obviously the right law, the right constitution in the right way. Um, and to put it in a broader context and to start off with your question, Johnny, um, and you also started to anticipate my, the first part of my response, is that this sadly, depressingly, is not unique, what, what is going on in Haiti now. It's actually quite, it's been quite common, all too common, um, especially in Africa, as you said, um, in a number of countries. Um, so I thought I'd just maybe start off with naming a few of them. You started off on a list. And also, I, try, I thought I'd try to extract some themes. Um, again, each country is unique. Each situation has its own particularities. But when you look at these constitutional coups, um, you do see some commonalities, some elements that are usually present to one extent, to one degree or another. And I also thought I would mention a few success stories that unfortunately there aren't as many, where these attempts have been foiled or they didn't last very long. Uh, they were eventually undone. And how did that happen and what happened? So maybe in those two parts of the, this presentation, maybe think about it through the lens of Haiti and what you're seeing and what we've seen going on in Haiti now. So first of all, you're right. I mean, and I worked in Rwanda and I have no illusions about the authoritarian dictatorship approach to Paul Kagame. Um, and in fact, I would often urge, uh, when I had some access to people in the US government, stop talking about Rwanda as a success story, as a wonderful developing country. No, it's a brutal dictatorship, um, vicious, no freedom, top-down authoritarianism, uh, not, not, a, not a nice place for human rights. Um, and the president there, Kagame, changed the constitution several times and now he's basically going to be able to rule, who knows, for as long as he wants. Similarly, in Uganda with Museveni, it's 30 some years and counting. Burundi, DRC, Togo, Chad, Cameroon, Egypt, you know, there, there's a lot in Africa where the, they have changed the constitution uh, in illegal ways for certain goals. It's not only Africa though, if you look also to Asia, you'll see similar uh, examples um, in, in, well, in Myanmar, and we see what's happening now in Myanmar, they're trying to undo a success story, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Thailand, and then of course in Hong Kong, it's a little bit different, but I think it's the same dynamic of a people trying to preserve some rights and some protections in, a, in an agreement with the United Kingdom. And now the government in Beijing has totally gutted that. 
And we saw all the demonstrations in Hong Kong and the youth out there in particular fighting that. And then in Europe, you have you have Russia, of course, with Putin, and he keeps now he could be president for whoever who knows for how long. Uh, Hungary, Poland, other Eastern European countries. What are they doing? What are all these countries trying to do? Basically, a couple of things. One is the people in power want to stay in power, so that's almost a given. So they want to keep power, and one way they do that is changing the terms of uh, how long they can be president. Usually, it's president and how many terms they can have. So again, think about Haiti as, as I'm going through this. Um, the other is they want to weaken other institutions. Um, they being the, the elite in power, usually it's the executive of some sort. Uh, so they want to weaken the legislature. Uh, that can be done a lot of different ways. It can be very creative. Unfortunately, human beings can be very creative in this field, but you certainly want to limit the, you know, the powers of the legislature in various ways and make it fairly toothless and a rubber stamp. Third is the judiciary. And again, think about Haiti here and what's been going on, especially with regard to the arresting judges, threatening judges. Uh, we heard about the pressure on the Cour des Comptes, which was in, in a very sensitive case with Petro Caribe. Um, it's clear in many of these cases, they want to defang the courts so that the courts either have very limited jurisdiction, certain cases they won't be able to hold. So they'll be able to control who is a judge, who isn't a judge. The tenure can be very much depending on if you're pleasing those in power. So in other words, the judiciary is very much undermined. And what we just heard about in Charlier say about the independence of the judiciary, the rule of law, good governance, that is the last thing that's on their mind. They want control and not, not separation of powers and certainly not any threat that, that one of their laws could be overturned or jettisoned in any way. So weakening the other institutions, controlling civil society, the media, I could go on and on, but I think you get the, the gist of it. Most of the times where these constitutional coups happen, that is their goal. Keep power, prolong it, concentrate it, increase it, and then marginalize and weaken any possible contrary or counterpoints to your power. Um, what can be done about it? And here I'm gonna get a little more positive. If you look at Sudan, Sudan's a really interesting case, I think. Uh, and it goes about a year or two ago, um, Sudan was ruled by a brutal dictator. I mean, uh, Bashir was indicted by the International Criminal Court. I worked in Darfur, as you mentioned, there was genocide in Darfur. Um, he ruled that country for, again, 30 some years with a very tight fist. But, and then the constitution kept changing so he could keep, keep staying in power. But all of a sudden through bread, prices in bread and other uh, basic commodities, people took to the streets. And I mean, people being young people, women, it was very interesting in Sudan, which is a fairly conservative Muslim society where women's public roles have generally been fairly constricted to put it mildly. Um, women took leading role out on the streets, leading rallies, leading protests at great risk. And some of the same things we've heard from Monique and others about being targeted then for violence, for shaming, for your, your, your dishonoring your family and much worse than that. Yet these street demonstrations, rallies, use of social media, which I know cuts both ways, um, really helped bring about a total transformation now in Sudan. And Bashir is now in jail. He's going to be, he's, his trial has started. And it's not totally rosy. It's not all, all hunky dory, but there was, a, there, there was success in, in Sudan. There was actually some success, maybe a little more limited in Algeria where again, Bouteflika had ruled forever. He actually, nobody had seen him for a few years. He was in a hospital, people weren't even sure he was alive, but he was still the president. And he kept trying, they kept trying to change the constitution to the law so that he could stay president until it finally, it was up. And again, it was largely massive street demonstrations and youth. Again, most of these countries as Haiti is, have phenomenally large youthful populations. So how do you mobilize the youth? How do you funnel and channel that energy? Uh, in a way that can really address these, these fundamental challenges to democracy and human rights. Um, I think in Haiti's, and also one other thing, outside powers, yeah, it can be really important for all of these countries. There are some countries that have huge amounts of influence. So again, think of Haiti, I don't have to say who it is, but once that outside power or powers or regional powers also signals to that government, okay, time is up, really, it's got to change here. Then you also see things can happen pretty quickly. And that's what happened also in Sudan 
in Algeria with France, Sudan, it was more Ethiopia and, and other countries in the African Union, some regional entities. So again, when you think of OAS, maybe CARICOM, and of course, it's in Canada, but I think the role of external actors and their influence, if they are gonna be exerting that influence in a positive way that support human rights and the rule of law can be a major, major factor. Um, and then things like sanctions, economic sanctions, withdrawing visas, things that make life more unpleasant for those leaders also can send a strong signal and help maybe lead to change. But it's not easy. I'm not gonna paint a rosy picture. I said, the, the disasters far outnumber the successes in this regard. And I think one of the big challenges we have for Haiti is to try, how do we figure out Haiti doesn't get into a further existential crisis than, than the one it's already in. I just wanna spend one quick minute, if I may, on a point, because it may not come up in question and answer, but I thought it'd be a very interesting point of information for the audience. I, I was really struck by the Harvard report. Um, I was actually teaching a course online for, for European diplomats. And the last day we were going over, I was going over some of the definitions of genocide, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And as I was doing that presentation in the back of my mind, I started to think, I think we're getting to the point in Haiti where you could argue that we see a situation of crimes against humanity for all the reasons that, that Joey and the report laid out. And so when the report came out, I was actually quite, quite pleased in a way, not that obviously that the crimes have happened, but that that analysis is now moving forward because it makes it, it gives an opportunity, first of all, to the United Nations, if there's pressure put on them, because there's something called the responsibility to protect. I don't know if people have heard about that R2P in the jargon, this is a doctrine, it's an emerging doctrine that was agreed to by all UN member states. And I mean all. I sometimes ask myself if the Chinese delegation actually read the document because I can't believe they got proved it, but they did. Um, and in that document, there's this two paragraphs, 138 and 139. And that basically says, if a country cannot or will not protect its citizens, the international community must act to help protect those people. So you could argue, I think, in Haiti's case, and, and it is triggered, the responsibility to protect can be triggered if you show that there is genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or ethnic cleansing. And I think we have shown that there are serious reasons to consider that Haiti now is suffering from crimes against humanity, and that there is now an obligation on all UN member states to invoke the responsibility to protect people in Haiti. And that can take various forms. I'm not talking about a military intervention. It could be things like sending in judges to work alongside the coup de comptes on cases like Petro Caribe. It can involve sending in policing experts to deal with organized crime and kidnapping. It can mean sending experts on prisons so that they deal with the inhumane prison conditions and all the prison breaks. So there are lots of different things that could be involved that would be more robust in terms of how do we help protect Haitians? Because now clearly, as we heard, people are afraid to leave their houses, schools are closed, hospitals are closed, you're not even safe at church. So I just wanted to raise that for people to think about um, be before we close today and then maybe afterwards, but thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Bill. And this is really a, a powerful summary uh, of, of sort of what we've been talking about. And it seems clear to me that, um, you know, the administration is essentially following the same patterns that other countries have used. And I think it's an important point because very often people don't understand what's happening. And when we put this in a broader, broader frame, people have a better sense to see, oh, wait a minute, we've seen this movie before, right? And so this allows for us to project, right, what can happen. So it's not something that you kind of make up in your head. You actually see this happening over and over. And it's like, it's a photocopy of what had happened in these other countries that are being done here. The second point before I introduce our next, our next panelist and last panelist is the fact that something that you brought up, Bill, is that you know there is the potential for the international community to, um, to do something, right, to, to, to act. And I think it's a very thorny and very difficult question for Haitians, particularly Haitians and Haitian Americans. Many folks have, have really deep <clears throat> feelings about what happened in Haiti before, intervention that happened before. And I think it's, it's, it's great that you brought up the fact that there are different ways for this to happen. And the important role that 
both the people in Haiti are playing women, youth, the movement that's happening in Haiti, but also the important role that those of us here in the United States must play. We must not think that we can lead this movement. We must understand that our role is to be in support of what's happening to the leadership that is evolving, the, the new leaders, the young leaders that are evolving, that are asking for an end in corruption and impunity, that are asking for us to have an economy that works, that is just, that are asking for women to have a place at the table. So I think, you know, we in the United States have to play our role and we need to be able to help, you know, inform our elected officials so that they understand that we're not asking them to go and send soldiers to Haiti. But we do think that the support that they're providing to the current administration is allowing this administration to continue the acts that they themselves has documented are illegal acts. So, um, you know, I'm going to turn over uh, 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 to our next speaker who will give us a view of this from Washington, D.C. Um, Jose Cardenas has had a very long career um, in U.S. relations in Latin America and the Caribbean. He has served in many positions in the U.S. State Department, the National Security Council, um, the U.S. Agency for National Development, USAID, and he has also served as an advisor to the Secretary General of the OAS and a staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So Jose is someone really who um, understand how Washington works. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen, Jose, in recent weeks, we've seen growing pressure from Congress um, who are sounding the alarm about Haiti. But as yet, the policy and practices of the Biden administration appears to be essentially the same as the Trump administration. Essentially, all the policies that the Trump administration has put in place is the one, are the ones that the Biden administration is using. Um, please, can you tell us what the role of the US government has been in this crisis and what can and should the new Biden administration do to help Haitian people who are working to end it? Thank you, thank you, Johnny. And thank you for uh, bringing together this uh, uh, incredibly timely uh, panel discussion on Haiti. Um, I, I would begin by saying that, uh, well, first I'm also humbled by the, uh, my colleagues here, uh, Haitian patriots who are there on the front lines, uh, but putting it all on the line for, uh, for their country. So my hat's off to all of you uh, for your passion and your patriotism. Johnny, I, I won't take a lot of time because I know that we wanna to get to some questions and answers, but let me give you a, a very quick review. Um, unfortunately, uh, Haiti has basically not been on the policy radar screen in Washington for a number of years now. The, uh, in the previous administration, most of the, uh, the political energy was uh, totally uh, devoted to the crisis in Venezuela, and then to a lesser degree, Mexico and Central America because of the migration pressures that we all know about. So it, uh, policy towards Haiti basically amounted to pushing Moise to uh, hold elections. And uh, this was a rather, uh, uh, you know, uh, a rather myopic, uh, too narrow vision because as they were pushing Moise to hold elections, uh, to reconstitute parliament, et cetera, et cetera. They were missing the forest for the trees. And that was the seeds that were being planted for the greater uh, societal crisis, as Valina has said, the existential crisis, as Monique has said. Uh, all of the seeds were being planted uh, for the last several years by Moise. And uh, US policymakers, unfortunately, uh, weren't a staying a pace of what was happening around their call for new elections. As you have said, Johnny, earlier in the program, and uh, uh, Deputy Tardo said as well, elections, I mean, objectively speaking, who, who could be against elections, uh, constitutional reform? Hey, that could be a good thing too. It's all in the way that it is done. And while the United States was calling for elections in Haiti, Moise was scheming. And, and here we have an electoral, okay, Moise finally says we're gonna have elections, but 
Under what conditions? Under what circumstances? Right now, we have an electoral authority that is totally controlled by President Moise, and you have a security situation in Haiti that is developing that what is that going to mean for voter turnout? And what you're going to wind up with is a tainted outcome that the, there's going to be no confidence among huge sectors of the, the Haitian population in the legitimacy of the outcome of an election in September or the follow on election. So um, there's been a lot of, of missed opportunities for the United States that we really need to catch up on. And as you noted, the situation, thankfully, is changing largely by the actions of Congress. And a lot of that has to do with Haitian Americans raising their voices to their particular members of Congress. You had a uh, House hearing um, in early March that began to turn the tide on Washington's recognition that there is a a serious situation developing in Haiti that the United States needs to get ahead of. And then the, uh, we had the letter, as you mentioned, Johnny, uh, that was written by Chairman Meeks and Congressman Jeffries to Antony Blinken, basically saying, hey guys, you gotta, get, you gotta get up to speed on what's happening in Haiti. It's no longer just something that, you know, we can't just answer the mail anymore on Haiti. We have to get, ahead of the crisis in Haiti. So I think that we're starting to see a change in Washington towards an appreciation, a recognition of the seriousness of the situation. Now, the problem is also is that we're in the middle of a transition from obviously the Trump administration to the Biden administration. It's almost a, a, a complete sea change obviously, in the worldviews of administrations. So what you have are, uh, and that, that transition is moving very slowly. There are only two senior political appointees right now at the State Department, one being Secretary Blinken and his number two, Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman. That leaves a huge policymaking bureaucracy without political direction. Any administration, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you need your people there to manage, to provide the direction to the uh, career people to develop the policy options, to debate policy, and then present them to the, the higher ups for final decisions. Unfortunately, uh, those people are just not there. And so you have career people there who are trying to manage, but they don't feel that they have the power vested in them to be making significant policy changes to the previous administration. So we're kind of stuck in a no man's land in that respect. So, uh, but, but the point being is that Congress is changing the uh, perspective and we are starting to see indications of, for example, the State Department is changing its attitude slowly but surely. If you watch closely the tweets of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the State Department officials in charge with Western Hemisphere Affairs, you'll start to see a little bit of uh, wiggle room on whether they support a constitutional referendum or not. Me, I think that it is it is outrageous, you know, just even setting aside the illegality of the president conduct, conducting unilaterally a constitutional referendum in Haiti, the idea that they're going to hold a referendum in the same uh, calendar year as parliamentary and uh, presidential elections is is it's is just mind boggling where where is when is somebody gonna uh, stand up and say wait a minute uh how how on earth can we have confidence that uh this can happen and especially the way he's doing it without significant uh polit popular participation in the process we are we are watching the 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 making of a toxic brew uh, in Haiti that is, is going to 
uh, end badly. Now, if I could, one last point about what can the U.S. do? Well, the fact is, is that, look, we all understand that Haiti is a sovereign country. It's a ward of, of nobody. But, but as Bill pointed out, there are uh, actors, international actors, that can have influence on the government for a variety of reasons, whether it's through assistance, uh, uh, you know, political support, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Bill brought up a good point about uh, the use of sanctions. And this is something I think that uh, the new administration needs to uh, uh, consider uh, significantly. The sanctions that are in, in targeted at individuals, not at the Haitian people. There may be some, uh, we don't wanna to touch obviously humanitarian assistance to Haiti, but for example, there, are, there is police assistance, police training assistance, non-humanitarian aid to, to Haiti, I think, should be put on the table for consideration of suspension. Anybody in any Haitian uh, official involved in the constitutional referendum or any uh, current Haitian member of the electoral authority, for example, should be considered to be sanctionable for their, uh, their undemocratic actions. And that means, uh, as, as Bill noted, they could have their US visa withdrawn, they could have their uh, assets in the United States frozen, or they can be barred from any interaction with the US financial system. And what the, the practical effect of that is, is that, you know what, they have to put their money in China or Russia. Good luck with that. Um, and, and so there are ways that can, you can influence behavior tactically and strategically, because what we don't want to hurt uh, are the most vulnerable who are already paying the price, but that we can get the attention of those around Moise who are participating in fomenting this, uh, this direction of events in Haiti that is, you know, heading towards a seriously a, a existential crisis. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for your comments. And I, I'll, I'll just I'll just make two very quick points to say that I'm, I'm sorry, Jose. Bill, Jose, um, I'll say two points um, from what you said. Number one, I, I think you know the U.S. even under President Trump actually did freeze the assets and has put sanction on a few Haitians who were involved in massacres, um, who were part of the the, the Moise administration and are still running around. Um, they're still running the country. Um, this, so, so we know that they can do this because they have done it, even if the past administration has done it. Um, the second point is quite often, you know, Haitian Americans will say, or Haitians sometimes will say, well, you know, we don't want, you know, foreign intervention. And that makes me smile a little bit because I am thinking the, 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 the Haitian government aligned itself with a number of other countries at OAS to say that they should remove president, uh, the president of Venezuela. So I find it quite interesting when folks says, well, you know, no one should be getting involved in our business. Um, and yet we say there is an international institution that we're part of that has certain rules and even though we were very close with Venezuela, um, for our personal reasons, we decided to support, you know, the idea that they should overthrow the president of Venezuela, but because because you know we they wanted to. So I just wanted to kind of highlight those things when folks make those um, suggestions. My colleagues have been keeping track of some questions, and there are some themes. So I'll go quickly through some of them. The first one is and because we want to maybe to focus a little bit on solutions. The first one is for uh, Deputy Tardieu. How should constitutional reform be approached in Haiti? From, from your experience, how should constitutional reform be approached in Haiti if that is needed? The commission that I chaired in parliament spent one year talking to the various sectors of society. We gave them a document on which they had to work for three months. After three months, we met with them 
an exchange about how they saw the constitutional dilemma. And then we use their remarks, their comments, their reports as, as ingredients to prepare the constitutional reform. So it really came from the heart and the soul of the Haitian people from the various sectors of population. That's the way it has to be. It cannot be five guys, five friends of Jovenel Moïse drafting a constitution and taking a couple of days to go around the country and pretending that they're having a national dialogue. It's just not going to work. And as Ose said it, it's bound to fail. And if it, they were to use money from the government or any kind of force to drag a couple of hundred people to vote, this is not going to sustain the test of time. We know it for sure. So it starts with the, the process has to be addressed first. The content, quite frankly, most of us know what we have to fix in the constitution in order for governance to work better, in order for the state to work better, in order for the economy to run smoother. I mean, we've, we've been there, done that. We just, we know what to change. And nine Haitians out of 10 would agree that certain things have to be amended. But it's all in the process, and it's all about who is doing it. And let me say that, I mean, I was hearing, uh, as, that was interesting, uh, Johnny saying that, you know, I get all the time I get the co these comments, don't talk bad about Haiti. But we're not talking bad about Haiti. We're talking facts. This is not wishful thinking. Let's say on a couple of facts. For example, uh, it, 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 Zell was talking about people living in 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 food and security four million stats are there it took syria 10 years of war in order to reach four million people affected by food and security and alimentation this is fact this is stats and this we have to say another fact that we have to say we have not mentioned it i mean regardless of how bad the process and the content of the constitution but the president itself most people agree that his term ended February 7, 2021. So we are not even talking about someone who has the legitimacy to be in power. And if I would risk myself even to go to Africa and maybe uh, take the Rwandan example, no matter how bad this is, and, and Bill was right about this, I mean, you know, it's, it's just not a, 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 a democracy. Of talking about a country that at least is functional, is working. Haiti is a country where all the signals are read. And these, the, and these are the statistics. And I would close to say that, you know, um, the, the impunity aspect that Verena touched is essential. Uh, this constitutional reform is all about impunity. There is an article 139 that allows the president and his ministers to have full immunity during their term and after their mandate. I mean, this is, this, this is very, very problematic. This is fact, and we need to take it very, very seriously. About accountability, the court of audit, uh, there to supervise public expenses. Let me just give you an example. It's a nine, member commission with Jovenel Moïse new constitution proposal four of these four of these members are appointed by the president and five by the president of the national assembly who most likely is going to come out to the same election and they'll have the majority in parliament so that's it there's no accountability anymore in in in, in managing governing uh, uh, transparency and public funds in, in Haiti, about facts again, and I'll conclude with that. I am the first one who agrees that the constitution needs to be amended, reformed, modified, call it whatever you want, but there's a way of doing this. And the single most important request demand of Haiti's diaspora, most of them are watching us right now, have not been taken into consideration. That's your right to vote. And this is why it is very important. It is very good that we have this kind of conversation, but in order for you 
to be more directly involved in Haiti's future, in Haiti's politics, you need to be able to vote. And just to give you an example, still using the stacks and the packs, there are about 4 million Haitians living abroad. If only 50% of them decided shall they enjoy the right of voting in their countries of residence to go and vote, that's about 2 million people. 2 million people, let's say half of it, would favor one candidate or one project or one vision. That's a million people. Only 500,000 people elected the current president. That gives you an idea of how statistically and politically important you are. So at this cornerstone of Haiti's life, Johnny, I'm telling all my friends in the diaspora, don't be misled because Jovenel Moïse might not be the friend that he claims to be, and you might not have the opportunity ever again to make sure that the right for you to vote is embedded directly in the constitution. In order for it to be embedded, it has to be in the process that is inclusive, participative, popular, legal, constitutional, and institutional. If it's not done that way, it's not going to work for you, and you're never going to be able to enjoy that right that you deserve. Thank you so much, Deputy. Um, the two, two points I want to highlight. First, I know that we are almost, we are at time, so we're probably going to be just a few minutes over. So I, I beg for your indulgence because we have a few questions that I want to get in um, before we end, because I think we, they are really important. Um, uh, Deputy, two quick things from what you said. One is the paradox that exists, um, the very constitution that says that it is illegal to use a referendum to change it. And that was in there for a reason. And the reason was because, as I said before, the Duvalier using it twice, the referendum twice, one to stay in power for life, the second to put his 19 year old son in power. Um, this is the constitution that gives the president his legitimacy. So if he's gonna disregard the constitution, which means that we essentially, we are gonna put the constitution on hold, then that also means that his presidency is on hold. He's, it, it, this popped in my head because yes, his mandate ended February 7th, but let us just assume that he's, you know, it, it was next year. If he's putting this constitution on hold because he's doing what he's doing now, that means he's no longer legitimate either because the constitution is on hold. It can't be both. You can't be half pregnant. The second thing that I thought was interesting is I've seen a lot of folks um, going to the consulates here in, the, in New York and Atlanta under the guise that they're gonna get their cards, their national ID cards so that they can go vote. When the regime's entire argument is support this constitutional reform so you can vote. So on the one hand, they said, we need you to support the constitution so you can vote. On the other hand, they are registering people to vote. So I, I, I'm totally lost on, on what is happening um, with this with this regime. There's a question well, on women in I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. There's a question ahead, on women and girls. And in terms of a sort of a positive perspective, Madame Kiska, could you emphasize um, the prominent role that women and girls should play um, if there is to be a transitional government or if there is to be a new government after election? What is your, how, how does that happen and what role should women play in public life? Well, I, I, I think there is a kind of new power in Haiti uh, with the uh, pro uh, Petro Caribe uh, scandal and the movement that came from the Petro Caribe uh, scandal, uh, women are at the forefront of that movement. And I'm talking about women like Velina, uh, who are at the forefront of that movement. And I call it the new political power. 
I've done some analysis and maybe I will write a little bit about that, but it is a very powerful movement that is driven in large part by women. And I think that is something extremely important that has not been seen in Haiti for, a, for, for at, at any time. So this is something very different. You have millennials who have taken power in various organizations, whether it is in Port-au-Prince or in the provinces, and it came out of the uh, accountability, uh, corruption, anti-corruption movement. And that is something that we have to pay extreme attention to and look out because these are extremely articulate women. These are women who have their university degrees, their lives and you know mothers, whatever, but they are the new power, the new political power in Haiti. So I think one has to watch very carefully what is happening with that. Secondly, I think there is a total disgust, excuse me, Deputy Tardieu, but total disgust with the most, I would say most all of the deputies and the senators in the last parliament. So that we are asking for a new a, a political class and that political class is there already. I mean, they are in power in civil society and they're running various movements. So I think it, once again, there is that demand uh, and there is the obvious handling of that political power. And then you have old hats like me who, who are there pushing uh, and working and uh, sometimes mentoring, sometimes they ask me for advice, but they're doing extremely well. And I'm, you know, I mean, I'm in awe of uh, what they have done, what they have managed to organize in the last three years, etc. And then bottom line, 52% of the population. So we, we just finished a survey uh, trying to see what can be done uh, so that women can occupy more spaces in power. And one of the things that this survey has shown is that there is a predisposition, not only on the part of women, but on the part of a lot of men. And I think it is driven by the data that is less, half of the population has less than 24 years old. So they are used to seeing women in power. They, are, they have no issue, no big issues with it. So I think there is a change that is happening in Haiti now with the need for a new powerful class, with the evidence that women are leading and they're leading extremely well. Uh, and third, they're educated, they can do it. So uh, we are involved in a campaign also to actually push for more women in power and a campaign called Fuck Nula, which will be launched in a couple of weeks to actually say women should be there. We're asking first, where are they? And we're saying that they are capable and we're saying they have the right to be in power. So I think, you know, it is being articulated very well. And I am very, very hopeful that there will be more women who are qualified, who are not corrupt, who will be, a, who will have to deal with a, all the men who had signed the Marriott Agreement. When you look at, look at Marriott picture, you see only men and then it failed. And when I look at the movements, you see men and women and we are moving the clock forward. So I think the way to go is to have men and women leading the change in Haiti. And we already have a very powerful young millennial. Uh, Velina mentioned she's 40. 
So until her last birthday, she was still a millennial. And you have quite a lot of Velinas running around in Haiti who are strong, passionate, educated, and who've shown that they can do it. So uh, I have no qualms, no worries that in the new Haiti, with social justice, with remove the apartheid, remove the exclusion, et cetera, that women will be a driving force of the new Haiti as we are in the movement to shape that new Haiti. Thank um, you. Johnny, if you allow me, like just, just one minute, uh, if possible. Okay, but go ahead. Uh, I would say um, to, to, to Monique, I, I totally agree with you. But I'd say, let's be careful. Personally, I have written a book that's called Dans l'affaire du Parlement. So I know how crooked this parliament can be. So I know I've been there. But let's not, there is the parliament as an institution and there are people who serve in it. Maybe the wrong people have been serving in it, but let's make sure that it's still there. And let's not do like Jovenel Moïse, and put it aside because in the future, as you said, we want the Verena Chaliers, the Edzieri Mills, and all of those folks, John Miller Beauvoir, and so many young, you said millenniums. Verena is still very, very young. She can, she can serve as a senator, she can serve as a congressman. So the new Haiti you're talking about is about new people coming on board with new blood, new vision, and new, uh, and, and new ideas, of course, we need that. So I agree with you, but you know, we need to, along the way, we need to make sure that the institutions prevail. And one last thing about you being a little bit <laughs> confused, Johnny, of course you have to be confused because they're asking our friends in the diaspora to go and vote in consulate and embassies while they're not even on a list. They show up with a driver's license, they show up with their passports, they show up with their ID cards, and they're allowed to vote. And they are voting for a constitution that does not include any provision for them to vote in the future in presidential elections. So it's an imposture. It's a big problem. And I've been very vocal about it because I don't want history to judge me for not having won my Haitian American friends, my friends in the diaspora, we have so many people living everywhere in the Dominican Republic, in the Bahamas, in Paris, in Europe, in, in Central America. I think that they need to be very, very, very careful as of what's going on right now. Thank, thank you, Deputy Tardieu. And I, I think, you know, uh, uh, the, the, I think I should also ask my friends, if you're going to vote for this, have you read the 282 articles? I think, right? That's like 280 something, almost 300 articles. So basically, they want people to vote on 300 articles. Most people do not know. Most people haven't read. Most people won't understand it. And the minister who's in charge of elections, uh, 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 Mathias Pierre, gave an interview on CNN about a month ago in which he says, if we have a million people who vote for this, we're happy. Why? Because there's no minimum. So if 100 people go and vote for this thing, they'll be happy. Um, so we need to be very careful. The next question that we had was for uh, Madame Charlier. What is the role Haitian citizens, especially Haitian Americans uh, in, the diaspora could, in the diaspora could do to help end corruption in Haiti? Um, first and foremost, um, you know, when I answer that question, my friends in the diaspora are never very happy <laughs> because I'm always very honest and I'm going to tell you. For corruption and impunity to end in Haiti, we must first, each of us, Haitian Americans or Haitian in the diaspora living anywhere, we must acknowledge and we must agree that we are part of the problem. What do you see when you come to Haiti? Anybody traveling to Canada or the States, they follow the lines, they follow the rules, they're very polite, and they just, you know, go by the book. As soon as the plane lands in Haiti, it is chaos. That very bad attitude about 
saying, oh, this is my country. I can do whatever the, I want. That bad attitude set the tone for corruption and impunity. If you are traveling to Miami, you would never see anybody going to Miami's airport, cutting in the middle of the lines because they have a friend of a friend of a friend waiting for them. And they tell they're the VVVVIPs. That would never happen. But in Haiti, they have no respect for elders. They have no respect for children. They have no respect for themselves. So that's where it starts. It starts with having respect for yourself, having respect for your other fellow um, country men and women, for having respect for the rules, and for just saying that no to corruption. Cutting into the line is corruption. Cutting into the line is impunity. That's what it is. So it starts with having the correct attitude. Anybody living in the diaspora who wants to help Haiti get out of corruption need to change the way and the mindset that they have about Haiti. You don't come to Haiti and then you don't take the line at the bank. Why would you do that? Because you wouldn't do somewhere else. And when you do not take the line at the bank and there's corruption, when you go and you give money under the table to somebody to do your driver's license for you or any kind of paper, when you don't go and you don't pay your taxes and you, or you don't pay for um, electricity or water or whatever it is because you are living abroad and you decide that you have a friend of a friend of a friend who's going to give you the papers for free and then you give that 1,000 goods, that is corruption. And that's where it starts. It starts with having respect for yourself, respect for your country, the change that we want to see. We have to be that change. And I will never say it enough. We have to be the change that we want to see. So it's not only um, being involved in the country that you are, getting involved in politics wherever you live, getting involved in understanding what the problem of Haiti is so that you can call your representative and demand better policies about Haiti. It is also your attitude about your own country. If you are proud of Haiti, if you're proud of following the rules, then you will be seeing the change because you will be the vector of that change. But for as long as in your mind, Haiti is some kind of garbage where you can do whatever it is that you want, the reign of impunity will continue and we will not see justice because that's what justice is about. Justice is also about having the right attitude. And this is what we do. Thank you so much. I know that Joey's going to have to leave very soon, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Joey, because I had some questions, a couple of other questions, but Joey, um, this report was was published, and I know that um, you know that it's been published online. Do you know whether there is going to be um, sort of your partners in Haiti are going to, to be holding different forms to ensure that people um, understand sort of these concepts that sometimes are not sort of the most straightforward concept for people who are not in, in the law. So do you know whether this is something that they plan to do, more communications around it to make sure that more people truly understand that what's being talked about in this, first of all, what was documented, and then what's being talked about in this, in this particular report? And I think, you know, also for the Haitian diaspora, if there are folks who are here in the United States who may be able to use what's in this to help inform their elected officials. Sure. Um, we held a press conference uh, with our partners in Haiti the day that the report came out, and it's also available in not only English, but also French and Haitian Creole. Um, so we hope that that will be circulated more easily. Um, our partners have also printed out physical copies of the report, uh, and we hear that Haitian newspapers are picking up on the report. I know it can be quite legalistic and esoteric, uh, but Hopefully, our, we, we try to make our executive summary um, accessible to everyone. So th those are the efforts that we've tried to do so far, uh, and we'll still be brainstorming more efforts to um, circulate the report. I think I just have one extra point to, um, to address. Uh, since we talked about the immunity clause in the proposed constitution, um, our report does address that, and we find that that shouldn't 
bar prosecutions of crimes against humanity uh, because the immunity for Muis and his senior officials um, are only for acts that fall within the exercise of presidential functions. So I think there's a very strong argument that crimes against humanity just cannot be um, within presidential functions. And under international law, uh, most courts, international and national courts, have found that crimes like crimes against humanity um, just cannot be official acts and um, cannot make head of states like President Moise immune. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joey. Tr truly appreciated you being with us and sharing the highlights of this uh, of this great report. Um, well, great of this report that that uh, um, you put together with your partners in Haiti. Um, and I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of us um, Haitian Americans who've read it um, uh, found it very useful to better understand sort of the legal concept. So thank you and appreciate that. Um, it's uh, the, the next question was for you. And uh, it had to do with the diaspora as well. And in someone who had talked about the fact that Haitian Americans sends about um, $3 billion to Haiti. And is that part of the problem? How can Haitian American use their money uh, uh, um, to help uh, uh, in this crisis? Yeah, thank you, Johnny. And thanks for the, for the question. Um, you know, as you said, uh, the remittances, what the diaspora sent every year is over $3 billion. Uh, but at the same time, we realized that, uh, you know, most of the money that they send, uh, you know, go back to the, you know, where they come from. Because Haiti doesn't produce uh, most of the, the, the goods that we consume. You know, almost 70% of the goods we consume are import goods, imported goods. So that means, you know, money from the US, from cousins, friends, parents, and then we have to, you know, send this money back to buy phones, foods, cars, and clothes and everything. So that means the 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 the, the key point right now is how to, you know, make sure that we can invest and then to 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 uh to in, to to enhance the 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 national production and and that would actually help you know i mean when you send remittances to haiti and then you could keep a part of this money to buy goods produce locally and then um you know there's other stuff like um for example that would be nice to have those uh, diaspora funds that we have in different countries in africa you know to really drive our money since we know a funding business is so difficult in Haiti with very high rate of interest. And, um, and then when the country will be uh, good for people to visit, it will be nice too, because a lot of studies state that it has more value when you come to the country to visit and spend a couple of days than sending money to parents and friends. So I think that there's so many different things that could, you know, make such a big difference, you know, compared to uh, the, 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 the money that's sent to Haiti. But at the same time, we, we know that uh, it's important for family to, to survive, but the, for the future, it's very critical to put emphasis on investment, on production, and how Haiti can, you know, uh, uh, um, can produce a part of the goods that we have to consume here. Um, but I don't know if I will have some time to, to do a remark before the, before the end, Johnny. I would like to just take a minute to, to say something. Well, I was gonna ask, I was gonna give you a break so that you okay. think about okay. your, your, your closing remark. I'll give you the mic. I'm waiting for, the, for, the, for, for my turn. You will for your turn? Okay, so I think I was going to start with Bill. I think we'll just do a final round table with your last comments. Um, we'll take a minute, uh, well, you know, maybe maybe 90 seconds for everyone to sort of each of you do a closing sort of statement on what we talked about as we wrap up. Um, Bill, I'll start with you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, gosh, yeah, I guess I can only reconfirm the links that several of the colleagues on the panel have made uh, between or among the rule of law, accountability, corruption, 
and participation. Um, and I think it's so important that I was really excited when the Petro Caribe demonstrations out on the street, seeing those numbers, seeing the youth. And I was thinking this could be it. This really could be the breakthrough we've been looking for. And it, it, it wasn't, but it was a great thing. And I think, how do we recapture that? How do we build on that? And, and I totally confer, uh, agree with the youth as the future of Haiti. I'm so impressed every time I go. And I just think, why aren't these people making the decisions? All due respect to uh, Deputy Tardieu, I totally agree. Preserve the parliament, keep its powers, and let's have more people like you. Uh, different generations are fine, but uh, let's get some of these young, really impressive people in there too. So just bravo to everybody. Kembe um, Palage. Uh, um, it's good. We appreciate the, the effort and uh, uh, with your Creole. Um, Jose, um, you want to uh, give us uh, some parting words? Yes, thank you, uh, Johnny. I, I would send a message out there to all members of the Haitian American diaspora that uh, don't, don't underestimate the power of your voice. Uh, these uh, Every single member of Congress has a website where they want to hear from their constituents, and it is not just a uh, you know a, a a missive that just goes off into the ether, uh, and no one ever reads it. They do read it, and there is power in numbers. Um, and do not hesitate uh, to to contact your local representative. The other thing is. Uh, that that is on the side of the Haitian people in this in this crisis is that this is not a partisan issue in Washington. Uh, anybody who saw the uh, and, you know, and that's saying something in Washington of today. Um, anybody who saw the hearing uh, from last March saw both Democrats and Republicans expressing uh, great concern about the direction of events in Haiti. And so that puts the wind at your backs. And uh, I, would I would just recommend to all Haitian Americans, keep that uh, pipeline, that channel open to your local representative because people are listening and that's what we need to, to start moving US policy in a more positive direction for the Haitian people. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, Deputy Tardieu. I don't know if Deputy Tardieu, can you hear me? Sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. It's all right. I, I just wanted to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be part of such a, a great panel. Some of uh, the people I knew obviously have uh, from people that I have the most respect for. It's their email uh, connecting us. I mean, even in Haiti, not often do we have bridges because, you know, we live a very, very bad situation. We're at 6 p.m. at night, everybody's staying home and there's no room really for meeting and exchanges. So that allowed me to, uh, to have a great conversation. Obviously, when I hear Bill and, and Jose, we, you know, we have friends. We have former friends who, who really deeply like Haiti. You can tell they care, you can tell they have a passion and they know, they know the country. We thank them for their interest. And obviously, Johnny, thank you. You've, do, you've done a, a great job. And I think we should also mention all of those who made this possible. I mean, I, I was very impressed with the list of institutional partners of, of this conversation. I mean, not, not the least uh, Harvard University, Harvard School, my, my alma mater, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Lowenstein International Human Rights Clinic, Yale Law School, the Global Justice Clinic, the Medgar Evans Evans College. I mean, Caribbean Research Center, all of these institutions are, are, are highly recognized and we know around the world, that means there's an interest on Haiti. And uh, I will simply say just, you know, following on the footstep of Jose, never, never estimate uh, uh, the power of, of your involvement and your engagement to make things change. So everyone has a voice and can make it heard through social media, through their participation in forums like that, or through simply being an engaged citizen. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a great conversation. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Madame Kliska. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to repeat how honored I was to be, to be invited and uh, very humbled also to be in such a great company. And uh, I think my message is to the uh, diaspora to, to understand the larger context of, a, of the crisis and uh, to know that uh, Haitians in Haiti no longer want to live in a kind of apartheid society. Uh, and uh, as the world is moving towards 2021, 20, 2022, and looking at the social agenda of uh, the Joe Biden, uh, ours is not as uh, ambitious, but uh, there we have a social agenda also so that Haiti can move towards the 21st century. And when they come and visit, they want to have health care. They want to be able to, they want to be able to enjoy the same things. I mean, tease, could you imagine Haiti uh, if they want to retire? Then what do you need when you want to retire? You want peace of mind, you want good health care, and you want to make sure that your children can visit. So, you know, the whole thing is about making Haiti a better place for Haitians to live and for the diaspora to invest also and to come help in terms of human resources, bank, all the expertise that they have. So it, it behooves them to really put their money, put their mouths where their money is because their money is already being invested in Haiti with the remittances. So the idea then is to really call their congressmen, call their congresswomen so that they can make their voices heard, make those changes uh, so that the Biden administration can not only take the right actions, but also recognize our sovereignty. And I think that is one issue that is important because what we want now is to act on those things like healthcare, a child care, education, et cetera. And I think it is important. That is an important agenda to move Haiti into the 21st century. So we, we want that sovereignty that can bring us towards that 21st uh, century. And that's what we ask that we be respected, that our wish, our demands be respected. So that is a, and they can help us, the diaspora can actually help us move that agenda forward. We count on them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Monsieur Emile. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, uh, every single uh, organization and institutions actually get together to bring this. And thanks for every single panelist. And it was a great conversation. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit with this question regarding money sent by the diaspora to remind the diaspora they have so much power and the future of this country is in their hands. They don't only have money, but they have connection where they live. And plus, and the more important thing, they have the competences that we need to rebuild this country. You know, World Bank said that 84% of Haitian who have a degree, master of PhD live abroad. So that means the people we need with competences, most of them, don't live in the country. We need them, we need them back, but not in this situation where the country is governed by gang or gang related. We need to create the, the good environment for them to come back, not only to invest, but only to also to use the tenses that they have, and they contact the connection that they have where they live to bring back the, 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 I mean, to, to, to make the economy work and to make the country move forward, as I see in, in Asia where I study. But I want to close this conversation, you know, to say that politics are, is deciding in our lives. So 
Don't let people who are not prepared with no vision, no interest in this country to decide for us in the future. It happened, but it shouldn't happen. Politics should start to focus on people, not on personal or group interests. The change is possible, the change is urgent, and the change will happen. I don't want people to think that we're so pessimistic when I talk about facts, you know, economy, you know, budget deficit, trade deficit, or negative growth rate. I mean, because we believe that the change can happen and the change will happen. I live in Haiti and I decide to stay in Haiti because I want to be a part of this change process. Even the risks are really high. No security, no justice. But we're still fighting. We're fighting for a cause. We're fighting for our kids. We're fighting for future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madame Charlier. Um, I want to remind everybody that we do not have a referendum or election problem. We have a corruption and impunity problem. We have a government accountability problem. Haitian, the people, we never took the streets to ask for a new constitution. We took the streets to ask for justice, to ask for government accountability, to ask for the end of corruption, to ask for impunity to stop. We took the streets to ask for social injustice to stop. We never asked for a new constitution. We do not have a problem of constitution. There is a problem of impunity in this country. There is a problem of people thinking that they can get away with crime. And this is going to stop. So I am warning you that we will not stop fighting until justice is served. And I want to thank all of you guys, um, especially you taking the time to talk to us. I want to thank you because you are allowing us Haitians to give a voice to the voiceless. And this is needed. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, a congressman who's going to say a few words, Sam. Merci en pile pour inviter me parler en titan. Hi, I'm Congressman Andy Levin, and I represent Michigan's 9th District. I'm so thrilled to talk to you briefly today at a truly critical moment for democracy and human rights in Haiti. I am so, so worried about the situation in Haiti, a country I've felt deeply connected to for more than four decades. I first went to Haiti as a college student in one of the between semester periods As in my case, you create your own independent study. I traveled throughout Haiti looking at the work of USAID. Somewhat to the shock of my host, the USAID mission director at that time, the paper I wrote concluded that the principal effect of our involvement was propping up the Duvalier dictatorship. <laughs> looking back, I'm afraid I was right. After learning to speak Creole while organizing Haitian nursing home workers in the Boston area, I served as an observer during Haiti's 1987 presidential elections after baby Doc fled to France. In choosing a law school, I picked Harvard in part because I could do clinical work in the Haitian community. I figured I would do tenants' rights work or something. Little did I know that Haiti's first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, would be overthrown the month before I started law school. So I ended up helping Haitians seeking to file asylum claims and coordinating the work of my fellow students on Haiti in the Harvard Immigration Clinic. That's a lot like some of the clinical work I bet the amazing law students involved in DHD do today. I then spent my first summer of law school, 1992, traveling throughout Haiti's 10 departments, interviewing people qui know my own, people who were in hiding for Human Rights Watch. I was the principal investigator and writer for that organization's book-length report, Silencing a People. 
Now I'm a member of Congress and I'm still determined to fight, to continue fighting to defend Haitian human rights and to ensure that US policy does the same. The Haitian people have endured state sanctioned violence, repeated violations of their human rights, rampant corruption, economic and public health crises, all of which have been ignored or exacerbated by the ruling elite. Too often throughout Haitian history, the US has enabled this kind of injustice. I won't go into all the details, but you know the story. Well, I'm saying no more. I'm ready to help craft a new foreign policy that finally listens to and amplify, amplifies the voices of Haitians themselves. Haitians must shape their own country's future if that future is to be just, egalitarian, and democratic. And I'm optimistic. Already this Congress, we've had a full committee hearing focused on protecting Haiti's democracy and Haitian human rights. That's an unmistakable signal we've sent of how important this issue is to this Congress. That attention is not going to let up. I'm ready to work with you and my colleagues to see a Haitian-led democratic transition now and a new US foreign policy moving forward. Let's get to work together. Thank you. Kembe Pham. I, I really want to thank um, Congressman Levin for the work and that he's been doing and his commitment to Haiti. Um, I wanna thank everyone here for your incredible insight today. Um, Madame Cliska, Monsieur Emile, uh, Deputy Tardieu, uh, Madame Charlie, Miss Bowie, uh, and the IHRC team, Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Cardenas. Um, I'm sure that the viewers will agree that we have a much greater understanding of the scale and the complexity of the crisis that Haiti faces today. As a Haitian, it is devastating to hear that the violence sanctioned by the government against ordinary Haitians, citizens like all of you. When we hear all of this, we hear that it is likely something that amounts to crimes against humanity, something that we would never want associated with our beautiful Haiti. Up until now, the international community has become fixated on this constitutional reform, particularly the BNU, United Nation. UNDP is printing out the paperwork for the documentation for the Haitian government and their focus on elections as a solution. Yet, it is clear from the evidence presented today that such reforms cannot be credible and certainly cannot be credible in the current context of state corruption and authoritarian repression. So you watch this today, what are we asking? We ask that everyone that had watched this today, this conversation, to help to end the crisis. You and the diaspora, particularly you who vote here, you have the ability to contact your representative, your elected members in Congress. Write to them, call them, ask them to condemn what the Moise administration is doing and its participation, its proven participation is in what will likely be determined to be crime against humanity and call for a transitional government to restore peace, to restore democracy and human rights. You can find out more on Defend Haiti's Democracy's website. It is www.defendhaitidemocracy.org, just one word, forward slash take action. To close, I want to thank all of our partners for making today's forum possible. To the Human Rights Clinic at Harvard, Yale, NYU Law Schools, the Medgar Evers College, Kiskeya University, and to all of my colleagues at Defend Haiti's Democracy who worked tirelessly to make this happen. To Sam, who was in the background trying to make it work for all of us. I wanna give a special thanks to all of our exceptional, exceptional panelists again, who I'm sure everyone will agree have enlightened us 
educated us, informed us, but most importantly, shared the reality of what is happening in Haiti. We love, we diaspora, we here in the diaspora, Haitian and who live in the diaspora love Haiti, but we must listen to the voice of those who are in the country and who are demanding a country where they can leave, they can lead life and peace. Finally, we should remember that those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. I leave you with the message from <clears throat> Representative Levin. Unmit me on some, let's get to work. And this time, let's make a difference. With this, I want to thank all of you and I want to say good night. And let's keep going and let's keep the conversation continue. Thank you so much and have a good night. <laughs>